guys, welcome back to the Awful Music Podcast. Today's guest you might recognize from the series I did on Christian music, Clayton Ferguson. He's a guitarist, had managerial and producer roles in various parts of the music industry, and currently produces large amusement exhibits. Clayton has a wealth of experience and knowledge of managing large and small projects, getting them off the ground and making sure that the creatives involved stay focused and that the goal is reached. There's a ton of valuable information in today's podcast. So let's get into it. Yeah. So, okay. So before we get, you know, so my, well, I got taught in the Disney mentality of there's, there has to be like a pyramid, like a pyramid is an unbreakable pyramid, meaning you have a creative, you have a producer, and then in, in the world of entertainment, you have a project manager or in music, it'd be an engineer. So like the idea that you have three different people who are looking out for different things where the producer's job is to bridge the gap and understand what the business, what, what are we making this for? What's the purpose and guiding people through where it, it needs to be. Is this song to be a num- is this going to be a number one song? Is this going to be a mega hit project that we're trying to get, you know, millions and millions and millions of dollars, or is this going to be a pure artist driven approach and then it's keeping people focused so like the i've always loved the producer role because it's about understanding what your parameters are and keeping creative and business and keeping it focused on what you need to do and oftentimes it's keeping everything out of the way so what i <laughs> no what no i don't know what do you mean out of the way <laughs> each other out of the way um not sometimes it's okay. Music is sometimes a little different because you have less influences. You know, you so have less people. So you're not talking people. within the, within the domain of music. I think it I think it's could through, be. I think it's through okay. all domains uh, when it comes to the creatives. Well, just what? Yeah. Could, could you explain? Sorry, I just I don't I don't get. What do you mean out of the way? Sometimes the mute button is the most powerful button in the world, and like saying no more is the best thing. A, producer or uh, somebody can say we've got this we don't need another drummer we don't need another thing we don't need we don't need yeah. more yeah because usually people most creative people and most most people say what about this what about this we can add this we can add it you know and yeah ultimately you throw the more you put it something it takes you off of the vision and the focus to what is the heart of a project? So you're talking about arranging right now, right? I mean, you're saying no, no, he's not. He's you're not, not? He's not talking about arranging. I mean, that you can, said you, that, st- that you said apply. mute button, right? Like that doesn't need to be there. The arrangement is sufficient with yeah. guitar bass, dr- one guitar instead of three or something. So what? So uh, what, for, for that specific application, out of the way. Oh, by out of the sure. way, you meant out of the way of the vision of the vision of where <laughs> you of where it needs to go. Yeah. So like, okay, the, the, okay. the mute button right. could also be like That's pretty meta. The, the yeah. mute the mute button could also be like, no, we don't need hacky sacks as a merch offering. You know, like that that also counts as a mute button. Like, what's our goal? Dumb idea. What are we yeah. trying to What are we trying to achieve? Uh, what's our budget for this? Nope, we're not spending over our budget. Oh, actually, we need to go over budget because this is something we actually need so it's looking at and it's really kind of fathering and and like giving birth to something you know that will go the intended way and so kind of curating what is relevant and effective within the domain within in order to establish the vision in as clear not only the vision but like the product too you know establishing a vision is a crucial part. What are we trying to achieve? How much money do we have? Where is it trying to go? Where is the, what's the intended part of it? And then you're in the middle of the, of the project and then everybody has ideas. You're throwing it in there. And sometimes it's like, we've got this. What do you have to find the heart of what is the right thing? Is it the melody? Is it the, is it the lyric? Is it, it's everything, but Sometimes you have to lean in and try to find, like the producer has to find what is it that makes it special and protect it at all costs. Yeah. Even right, if right. even if the okay. creative doesn't believe that it's the case. <clears throat> yeah. yeah I, 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 oftentimes. To, 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 totally understand that. Yeah. Okay. I see. So it's, it's the, in, you know, rec- in the last 15 years, you know, the music business has changed. And so like you used to have, you know, 
your a r guy staying in the corner hovering, you know, mm. and then you have, you know, somebody else, the publisher, you had 15 people who usually the producer has to keep everybody out, you know, and you have all of these now superfluous jobs, you know, that really aren't there. And so it's like the process is even more small, you know, and so oftentimes the producers Sometimes the engineer, you know, it's like there's multiple roles that one person does, but yeah. in, in a perfect role, you have somebody who knows what their role is and is to own that role. And, you know, I'm just saying like the, the creative has to keep being creative, but like, no, we got that. That's the right, that's the right take. That's it. And, and that, and that call is one that would you in this you would say that's that's the type of call the producer. It's the producer's job to make. Should. Okay, yeah. Okay, right. okay. No, it's I the mean, same process you, on saying, anything. You know. Are you saying that this consolidation of roles is is bad or or good or, or neither? Or it's not even your point. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I'd ask you guys that. You know, it's like you're bad. <laughs> it's bad. <laughs> it's, I hate it. I, I don't know. And, and which is funny as someone who is. Literally, like I'm, I'm the embodiment of the way the industry has evolved because I do engineering, production, mixing everything by yeah. myself. Performing. I don't perform. I so hate you performing. perform on your record. I used to. Oh, you mean? Oh, you mean the? Uh, yeah, the, actually you performing do the, the the performance. The parts. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 yeah but um, man, that's. I think that might be one of the reasons, and my view on that, one of the reasons might be that when I listen to records from the '90s and the early 2000s, they're just usually way better to me. <laughs> In every way, mm-hmm. not just sonically, but um, the the vi- the vision. Uh, it it sounds like a, there's a much more. Uh, the art knew what it was. It knew yeah. what it was. Yeah. You know, a lot more more a lot more clearly. It seems. Uh, so when you're Casey, like you're on a pro- like you produce a project or you're doing a vocals, it's like you have a complete different perspective, right? you're hearing something that you don't have an emotional stake in, you know, from a creative stake. You mean and when I'm a producer? Yeah. For example? Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. So you see something far more different and more clear than when you're emotionally sometimes involved, you know? Yeah, so, yeah. so the argument is, is if you are doing the creative, the producing and the engineering, it's like, it's hard to, how do you switch the hats? How do you keep in reminding yourself on what the goal is? Yeah. And usually if left to devices, creative people will never stop. It's yeah. It's interesting. Cause for me, the experience is, of wearing all hats simultaneously is they've kind of, they've kind of coalesced in this way where I'm, that actually, right, so like, okay, so if I'm producing and I do this weird thing where I mix as I go, what that actually ends up doing, because you're mixing, you know the way it's going to sound when it's done because it's like kind of done as, you know, like as you're doing George it. George Martin. Okay. Um, we'll get back to that. <laughs> uh, you can make arrangement decisions or production decisions in the moment that are that are kind of like, a producer would if you if you're good at mixing and engineering and, and everything and arranging i can have a drums bass guitar for a, or a section and know because it's already mixed yeah. that there, there's enough there to to make it to have the impact emotionally that the creator me was intending and then the mixer me is like oh it sounds big i don't need to add another thing being the producer and mixer while you're being the creator facilitates better uh, it facilitates your creator self being a better version of itself, I think. Because hmm. you know how to be more concise. You don't layer 13 guitar parts when it's already mixed. Two sounds sufficient, right? I, I think there, there's a double-edged blade there. And I think it's it's not necessarily hmm. that you have to wear multiple hats. I think you could still very well wear multiple hats. It doesn't, feel, there, it doesn't feel like multiple hats to, for the Yeah, record. yeah, yeah. I, I got you. Yeah, yeah. But like, um, I think just the aspect in, its, in itself of collaboration, which I think might be what you might be missing in some of today's music. I'm not sure. I mean, I could be mm-hmm. wrong. It seems like, at least for pop songs, there's an epic level of collaboration. I just I don't know how many people's souls are actually in a bunch of these tracks. You know? It's a nightmare. If I'm in a country, right, and there's six people in the room, two people are writing the song, You sometimes it's just one and then one guy's running Pro Tools 
or if, if it's one where I'm running Pro Tools, uh, the other day, I came in and like it was just the two writers here, and they were just doing doing all the writing, and I was just making the track happen. Mm -hmm. um, but then some some country rights are a nightmare where there's like four other people that are just looking at their phones and then take equal share. It's retarded. Uh, <laughs> Can we say that? If I, I don't give a shit. Yeah, I so I, yeah, I don't know, but it sucks. Um, yeah, I mean, there's some people that have proven that they can do it and that they can see holistically what's yeah. the connective tissue. I mean, every person that, you know, that sees what the end needs, you know, you want to begin with the end in mind, right? You know, you want to know where yeah. you want to go, but rarely can you do that, engineer it, you know, get the sounds you want and then creatively perform it. But like some people do it perfectly. I, you know, in the movie business, there's James Cameron, you know, as an example of somebody who, you know, Avatar oh. in his movies where he's not known to be a nice guy in any sort of way, but he, yeah. but he protects, but he rarely can one person get a force and get exactly what they want. So collaboration is a very interesting word, but how rare is it in music or is anything in the creative field that one person has that vision and can execute a vision that is it's both so great rare like yeah. I, the, the only two I know, examples i, I, I can think saying, of yeah. offhand and this is even up for debate because they're not widely butch walker. loved okay, butch you, walker. okay you, you think butch walker for sure that's fair um steve vi and devin townsend dan huff yeah dan huff yeah. dan huff where right, he's just uh Man, Without, have you listened to his giant stuff? Oh, God, that's why I care about him. <laughs> that's why I care. Last so of the Runaways good. and Time to Burn and Three, the one the length that they did in the 2000s. It's the same. It's just as good as the as the 80s, early 90s shit. Okay, um, so he's one of the reasons I'm a musician. You guys have to get my buddy, um, guitar tech Dave Graff, on your show. I'd love to. Dave, he, I've introduced him. So yep. he's he and, and uh, he's guitar tech for everyone. Uh, this one small up and coming guitar player was his first guitar tech. His name was Randy Rhodes. <laughs> um, and he's done the Eagles, you name it, like every major he, he works project with in the, the world. He works Dan with Huff. Def Leppard right now, right? Uh, now he's with Foo Fighters. Oh, uh, so okay. he's Foo Fighters now. But he's like, he's he and he's Dan Huff's guy, but he also plays like a mother. Wait, so he's a, he's a tech. <laughs> he's a tech. He's a player. Okay. He's but most player. techs are pretty ridiculous players but a like, lot of times. Okay, dude, I'm just telling you, you got to get him on your show. Like it's uh, the stories. Would love to. Are yeah. un, he's the best storyteller yeah. can right now and just <laughs> tell stories. Yeah, that'd be, that mean, that's also fine. I'd be cool with that. That's great. <laughs> yeah. Like a great podcast. <laughs> it would be the your. When he's 17 years old, comes from a Christian home and goes on the road with Ozzy Osbourne teching for Randy Rhodes. 17. <laughs> That's great. You know, the process is, you know, I think music is a great example on one end of the spectrum. And then you have movies uh, on the other end or series. And what, sure. I, yeah. what I do is I, I design, you know experiences and exhibits that tour the world you know and mm -hmm. and I, I feel i feel like that's a real general undersell <laughs> you you yeah, do yeah. some pretty sick shit i would like, love to see them man do, like, but they're like, never in nashville right never in nashville yeah like immersive big super cool exhibits uh, Very, they're, they're all across the board i mean like i've been doing it for 20 years and it's uh everything from South Park to Harry Potter, the Marvel Avengers, Avatar, and like you get to work with all of these, the filmmakers, the creators, and like you're making something where people will spend 40 bucks, 50 bucks to go and spend time in a world where it's storytelling and you're trying totally, to evoke this, you know? So you told what, me about the Halo one that I wanted to see that so bad come to life, but I mean, obviously like yeah. things, things, things go as they go. But man, that that would have been like you had a really cool concept for that. <laughs> for every five great ideas, one happens. Maybe ten what, great can ideas. I, can I hear about that, or is that the so the only parts that I remember is that you are on a sci you're on a scientist research team, and you're going down to the planet Reach, and this is all an AR experience, augmented reality, not mm. VR, and, and physical mixed reality. So you have physical experiences with augmented reality. 
and you, you go down yeah, under the planet yeah. reach and then like discover it and i'm sure you like encounter a bunch of creatures and stuff and probably imagine covenant as well but either way super cool <laughs> yeah <laughs> really dope like that like that especially with the obsession of the halo franchise people would die to have that experience Halo's been trying to relaunch the brand for so long, you know, and like the Microsoft uh, guys are great, you know, but like they're still working on the, you know, we had this whole idea and business plan. It would have been awesome, but like it all goes down to release dates and, you know, they, it all goes back to when are they going to release the, the next level of Halo. And after a while, year, year goes by and then the investors kind of forget about it. And, oh, yeah, yeah, I remember that, you know, so it's a it's the same like the same process of the music business is in all aspects of entertainment is like chasing down an idea how do you monetize that what's uh, what's the goal what's it worth to spend on something and how much can we make out of it can it sounds I, like there's a lot more people involved there's just oh a yeah. lot more general cat her- <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. a lot more general <laughs> cat herding oh it's, okay. I, that's really my title should be yeah. uh, my title is like Chief senior cat herder yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I said like my my title is senior executive producer and it's like yeah it's fancy but really i just heard cats yeah the, uh, you yeah. explaining that process of trying to chase down an idea and wanting to be excited about it and then it just doesn't happen for whatever reason. I think it perfectly exemplifies another quality of being a producer that's so necessary. You can't let anything be precious. Yes. Yeah. You have to fall in love. I mean, it's like we're talking about my our buddy Busby, you know, a songwriter, producer. And, and I try to embody the same process. Like you have to fall in love with something. What you go and you have to you have to believe that whatever it is in front of us is going to be the best thing in the world. Sometimes you either have to sleep on it or come back to it two weeks later and you almost have to talk yourself out of it. See if you can fall out of love with it. Yeah. Yeah. And then if you can talk yourself out of falling in love with it, all right, was it as great as what I hoped? Yeah. You still got to throw the same amount of passion in, Yeah, yeah. but sometimes you have to either yourself or somebody else be able to share it and say, is this as awesome as what I think it is? Mm-hmm. And somebody's like, eh, and then you got to like get rid of it. You have to let it sleep and you have to let that baby go. And it's really hard, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, you know, for every hit song, uh, a songwriter has, you're going to have a hundred or 200 or 300 <laughs> more not failures, but various degrees of success, but not going to be that hit. Yeah. So it's like you almost like a hit and something like a blockbuster in the world that I make. It's a different thing because you're des- you have to make it try to make it a blockbuster, but then you look at it objectively and say, is this worth me or my investors or my my team putting fifteen million or a hundred million dollars into something? Fifty dollars. Oh, yeah, that, that was Tuesday, man. Yeah. <laughs> What? What do you mean? I was just like, fucking, that's so unusual for most people. <laughs> that's like, absurd. Yeah, we're, play, we're playing with $50 million on my creative project. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm on my playtime. <laughs> I'm working on a project in Vegas right now with, that's $100 million is our budget. Is that the, is that the, is that the, is that the F1? Uh, I can't talk about it. Oh, damn it. All right. <laughs> for the audience who doesn't know about your experience in music, would mm-hmm. Would you talk about that a little bit so we could talk about how just, your skill just set? A, just a gen- general. Generally, background. just because I was yeah. I was going to ask about how your skill set in music, uh, if at all, translated totally. into Same. what you do now. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I started off as a musician, you know, and played in bands and <clears throat> made a good amount of money for musicians, you know. Which is how we became friends. Yeah, exactly. Because po- post COVID lockdown, I was wearing a Wildwood guitar shirt, and you're like, you you're probably good at guitar. <laughs> Uh, what do you play? Yeah, yeah. What do you got? And then, you know, guitar yeah. players, all you can do is talk about gear for <laughs> yeah, yeah, five months. Yeah. <laughs> yep. You know, and so, you know, the music route, but I always wanted to be a manager, producer, you know, the business, guiding the creative process has always been my love. Oh, okay. So, like, I produced some records and found out I was pretty good, but I'm not awesome, you know, and so, like, it's one of the hard things is in life is to say... I'm pretty good at this, but am I great? You know, and yeah. it's like I think what I always realized that what I cared about was the the creative process, which is, you know, as we all know, there's a lot of sharks and lawyers, uh, you know, in the entertainment business who are going to try to prey on creatives, and 
I'm a believer, I'm a capitalist and that believes in creativity and empathy and treating people right. And I think mm. there is a, there's a line where, you, where everybody can win. Yeah. But usually I don't believe in win loses, but most mm. creative, most people in the entertainment business believe I win, <coughs> you lose. And there is a spot where you can do it right. So it's like, but it, you have to protect creatives yeah. and the creative process. So I, I've just always, when I'd go on tour as a road manager, I'd learn front of house. I'd learn the merch business. I'd learn the lighting and video and, and ultimately it's like, okay, I kind of fell into the film business accidentally when a record label, I was an A&R guy at closed and we became a, a big film company overnight. Clayton, do you want to be a marketing director for Disney movies? Okay. You know, it was literally an accidental type of a space and jeez. but it's still, but at the end of the day, it's storytelling, it's narrative. It's like, how do we affect people's emotions? How do we move people? And it's, you can just get distracted by everything out there. Oh, that's a great guitar tone. Oh, I, that's a really shiny, pretty thing. I'm going to focus on. Nope. If you if you uh, pare it down to it's about the song. Yeah. And that's what Nashville yeah. really taught me is it's about yeah. the song. Yeah. But in the storytelling and films and, uh, and experiences, ticketed experiences, it all comes down to the story. And like, how are we trying to move people? What are we trying to evoke uh, out of people? And then you protect that with your life. And, yeah. and that's really the process that music business taught me is, uh, you know, there's far less money in it. And so you have to like be even more protective on that. But like in film business, it's the same thing. It's, uh, the, it's understanding what we're trying to achieve. How do we do it? Where do we go? But along the way, you know, every script you read that gets greenlit for a movie, it's usually awesome. But then when you see the final move, you're like, this is crap. You know, how did it yes. get here? And it's like the process is somebody has an opinion who's a lawyer and they go, well, I'm not sure if this is going to test well with ages, you know, 13 to 17 in Nepal. You know, do, do, you, do you think that's what happened to the movie Encino Man? Because <laughs> like I, movie? Encino Man, I mean, it has it has Frickin', I mean, Polly Shore, God bless, but I mean, like, okay, that's like trying to play to the uh, novelty that was Polly Shore of the early yeah. 90s. But then you had, what the hell's the guy's the guy that played Samwise Gamgee, was in the Goonies. Oh, I know him. Uh, yeah, Sean, Sean Astin. Yeah, I played yeah. in a softball team with him. Oh, oh awesome. Okay. Oh. But like, Sean, <laughs> Sean uh, Astin. No joke. Sean oh. Astin isn't like a pushover actor. No, you know? he's, yeah, he's yeah. great. Yeah. And, and then you had uh, Brendan Fraser. How do you mess this movie up? Easy. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's so like the it process is a, of a fun concept that's like yeah. right in the pocket for the, the zeitgeist. But yeah. OK, so that, that's a hard, a hard example, because a lot of movies are they get sold to a movie studio on of a, hey, we're going to have this, this, this and this is going to be awesome. <laughs> yes, yes. Here's thirty five million dollars. Go make it. And everybody's like, yeah, it's going to be great. And sometimes it is. Yeah. Um, but usually it's a script. You know, you go through months of revisions and then you get something great and then you have to fight so it doesn't get fucked up along the way. And most of the time it gets fucked up along the way because somebody has an opinion. They want to do this. Hey, maybe we should do this. And like, huh. sometimes it's like creativity means being brave and going after something rather than, uh, you know, compromise, like compromise is important, but sometimes being brave and saying no is harder. And where do you draw the line? Yeah. Cause when you, a lot of times it sounds like what you're talking about is people who have opinions that almost in some cases might be based on probability that it's something totally. becomes more likable if you adhere to their suggestion. Um, so, but then you end up alienating other people and watering it down and you have to prioritize that. Yeah. 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 I mean, I, I personally find the most creative success and uh, happiest with the end product when I only work with one other person. At, for all no, specifically Yuka. <laughs> yes. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Your your work wife. Yeah, my no, he's my gay husband. He's my husband. Not wife. <laughs> yeah, cuddling and everything. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. Yeah. I'm not gonna cuddle later. You got him. Yeah, you, I got you, him. I mean <laughs> it's like I think that you hit on something like that 
you have to have the fewest amount of people to protect the project, but like getting the right people who are going to disagree with you or going to tell it. Yeah. 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 Tell you that your shit is stinky, you know? And then like when it's not there and you can hash it out. Yeah. So it's like when I put together a team, like I want to create a team of rivals, so to speak, Mm -hmm. who are going to be fighting against each other, like, but not to fight and for their own reasons, but to fight for the betterment of what it's going yeah. to be. Yeah, fuck a healthy yeah. rivalry, and when, fuck yeah. And, yeah. When there's, and when the right idea comes out, everybody goes, yes! There, there's whole anime is built yeah, around this concept. <laughs> this is amazing. It's a, you know, it's, a, it's an Abraham Lincoln, <clears throat> you know, his cabinet, you know, is a team of rivals. You know, you don't get yes men. But most people put yeah, no yes way. men around to Hold. get it to say yes. Okay, can, you're, can you're I right. Pa- can I pause you? Okay. That's just ego. So, yeah. hold, hold, wait, 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 wait. So, you turned me on to the concept that, and we, this is because of a um, specific, very prominent figure. Um, you turned me on to the concept that the corporate culture and CEOs pit people against each other internally. Oh, yeah. Okay, so how do you distinguish between what you're talking about with this rivalry and that kind of culture? Because, like, I, like oh. if you just think at, like, the words on face value, it sounds toxic to say, well, I'm pitting these people against each other. But then also there is something good about a healthy rivalry and competition. So that's, that's where I'd, I'd love to get a differentiation between those two. Um, wow. Great question. I'd okay. say, well, what, it, what do you imagine the intention of, of the pitting against, you know, that would be, yes. that'd be the, 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 the difference. Uh, a CEO of a major corporation that I worked at was, uh, ran a massive sports and entertainment. Like, so he had a sports division, film division, music division, experience division. Um, and you, the mentality, uh, corporate mentality is you pit divisions against each other. So the best one wins, you know, and so one, one person is going to win. Other division is not going to win. So it's pure greed. It's, it's pure performance. And I thought they're different roles though, but they're not, I guess. That's right. Uh, it's uh, a diff- slightly different. Okay. So if you're in a corporation, okay, I'll, I'll just say like, so John Bon Jovi, uh, had two, had two business managers. One was his music manager one was his film manager we were working it with him on a movie and he um you know he pits his music guy versus his acting guy and whoever makes the most whoever can make the most money for him or something else will win out you know it's like it's always what's going to be the best so people are going to naturally fight to get that attention and get that money in the you know the, the their 15 20 percent out along the way Whereas in creating a, a team of rivals, so to speak, is you find people that are complementary that will not say yes, where they are not selfish. Yeah. That they are, that is not to, for their own ego, but it is for the betterment of what they work on. They yeah. care. They give a fuck. <clears throat> mm-hmm. So it's like, I guess, looking at those two scenarios, it's like they're both using the force, but one's light side and one's dark side. Yeah. <laughs> I'll I'll go retire my man card now. <laughs> yeah, what? No, just, just, we'll move by it. Don't worry about it. It's a terrible, horrible, embarrassing analogy. It's interesting because it's like um, I have to trust e- even even like throughout the years of looking for people to work with, having good time, uh, good relationships, productive ones, ones where I thought we were complementary, times where I thought we were competitive in ways that that weren't productive. Um, at the end of the day, it's it's funny because I'm like, it's just a matter of getting better at curating who you know is going to push you in the ways that you need to be pushed or challenging the ways that you need to be challenged, which which takes a, a, enough emotional maturity to know like what you your shitty what is shitty about yourself to where you know how to compliment that to choose to to be the one to choose what who that person is that's going to do that for you and they have to be like you have to feel you cannot feel like you're the smartest or most talented person in the room that's just my biggest problem yeah. i mean <laughs> i hate feeling that way too i'm so bored yeah. when i feel that way it's the most boring feeling to feel like you're the you're the best yeah you don't you want to be the dumbest i want to 
I want w- the best people out there because yeah. Lord knows I'm not, you know. And yeah, that's how I feel. Like, yeah, but we have to know your. I think you have to know your blind spots. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes, it's massive. Imagine having that. Like, imagine all these kids in music nowadays who are coming up as, you know, they call them bedroom producers with how good technology and, and recording dolls have gotten. Um, one of the one of the destruct one of the things that uh, has destroyed the recording industry is like, is just laptops with DAWs and great amp sims and drum programming libraries and all these things and so it, and it, so it, now inno- like innovation yeah innovation does that <laughs> yeah but there's yeah like it's good and bad they're, they're, yes there's, it's a trade off there are positive hundred percent facets totally to that and negative ones and um, it's just where was I going with this. Um, those kids coming up, probably thinking they're the shit. They're hip producers. Yeah, you, you get, yeah, like, ima- but imagine, like, God, because it's so easy to release music. It's so easy to produce and record and mix it. Not necessarily well, but you but, don't, you but don't you, actually you finish, really need to know uh, much about the physics or the math of any of it anymore. You really don't. Yeah, but that, that's all yeah. done on the front end. And imagine with how how many kids or like in, end, in their teens are coming up and doing all this themselves and putting it out onto releasing music on Spotify you know, level playing field that it might not be. Uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. It's uh, imagine having the kind of emotional maturity that we're discussing that's necessary for you to become the best version of yourself at that age, and and the the level to which the market is saturated by by younger kids doing that, and I mean, it's definitely a recipe for like the majority yeah. of things coming out in certain genres, the genres that lean younger, like metal. Yeah. Just all sounding the same and all being worse, and productions that sound like an arrangement mess because it's a guitar player and it's 13 guitars at once. It's almost and always a guitar player, yeah. Almost it is. always, look at me, look at me, yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, look at me, <laughs> yeah. It's just like, how do we, how do we, th- this is this is what this is where we get into the cultural side of things and the where you have to worry about your function in, in a capitalist, uh, not that I would, I wouldn't argue that we have capitalism and we're not doing that now. We're not doing that. <laughs> I wish we not. did. I, I love capitalism, but, uh, just gonna, yeah, we're just not gonna doing, fucking we're clip, not, clip that out and put it on repeat like 10 times. <laughs> <laughs> I like capitalism. Yeah. But, um, money's good. And, <laughs> Wait, what was I? What was I saying? God damn! Why can't I keep my train of thought? We're, we're, we're talking about how to exist in a capitalist system, with um, tr- trying to be. I'm assuming you're trying to say trying to make as much money as possible, but also trying oh, not sorry, to no, ruin the, fucking society. The, yeah, like when we when we're t- when we're talking about like ways to profit from um, whatever it is that we love, uh, whether it you know with music or whatever, um, and we worry about. We get seduced by the possibility that we could get that million dollar check for doing a, a pop song or something. The least amount of work possible. But, yeah, I, I, but I'm, then we're worried about the I, future. I challenge of, that statement. And we'll come back to that. But, <laughs> and, and so that require that requires in a way that you not challenge people, but give them what they already want. Give them what what uh, mathematically, probabilistically is likely that they'll spend money on. But then we're worried about. Then, then we're sitting here and complaining like hypocrites about um, about the trends that we're facilitating by mm. by trying to create things that don't challenge people to change. <laughs> that that's a fair point. No, that that is you absolutely I mean, a fair point. And, and, I, and that, I just feel like a hypocrite. You know, so like, I was I was and talking And that's part about, of why I sorry. And that's part. Sorry, one, man. Sorry. And, and that's part of why I have a harder time. Literally, have a harder time sleeping at night when I work on. Um, you know, music for profit during like tomorrow and, and that, and that or is literally the, this week. That is literally the goal of what you're doing. Like I, that's the thought process going into it. Like yeah, I, but I, then I when that. I work with Yuka, it's just for fun, and we're trying to make shit that challenges us, that challenges other people, that have, that makes them feel the way that we think uh, that they ought to. <laughs> you know. Yeah. So so here's uh, here's where I'm coming at it from a weird angle. So. Um, I, I think we can talk about this at this point. I don't know how. Sorry, just, was that clear? It was very clear. 
At least to me, it was very clear. If you, if you cash in on trends, how can you expect to change the world? That's the end of it, right? <laughs> so, okay, so, so, okay, so here's I should have just topic, said that. Yeah. yeah, I should have just said it that way. So, so here, here's the angle that I, I come from with that. So, I mean, I guess, unless we want to keep it mysterious, I can clip this out or whatever, but um, you, me, and Yuka are talking about doing some, some pop writing. With the, with the goal of being num- of number one, be with winning a Grammy. That's, yeah, but that's we want goal. we want it to be awesome, and we want to take risks, and like we did. Good. No, yeah. the the, the yeah. three the three of us. I don't, I don't think that's I don't think I don't think that's the goal at all. I mean, I really, <laughs> I mean, I really like pop, and you can as too. And I don't know how you feel about it, but I want to make awesome pop with you guys. I I want to. I mean, I don't want it to be like trash. I don't want it to come on the radio and I be like. Man, I can't believe my name is attached to this. So that's obviously not going to happen. But um, what I, what I more mean is like like it's not going to be the pinnacle of fucking art, and it's it's probably going to be somewhat stupid. It's going to be so, somewhat candy. I mean, the Neptunes, mm. happy, you know. Uh, it's fucking like fucking love that. You know song. what I mean? It's like that's... and it's it's about as base as you could possibly get of an emotion, and it's amazing. Yeah, but the textural palette of that production is is innovative, and yeah, and okay. there's nothing, and, and just because no, he's no not one challenging ever you thinks emotionally, about that. <laughs> I'm not no, they don't. You're no, wrong. no, but they feel it, and, and yeah. they feel they don't know how to describe it. But, but they're not but, trying. To, I don't know. I wonder if he was trying to actually make a crazy song. He's probably just like, I'm just going to create something I'm, I'm bravely gonna, different. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he, he was just probably yeah, shitting probably. something out pretty yeah. quick. <laughs> in, I mean, in a it, great way. Even like, just because something. Oh my is gosh! A, a hook. Let's stay on it. Yes, I'm yes, going. Yes. Let's go. Let's go. 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 Yeah, I mean, I don't. I don't think that, and not that anyone here said this, but just because it something is is emotionally one dimensional doesn't mean that it's not valuable or useful mm-hmm. or. Okay. Good. Okay. We're we're good there. Because that song is <laughs> is very much that, but it it w- it was experimental though. Uh, in the context of of the top forty at the time, there was nothing. There was very there were very it, few productions utilizing that textual not, palette. Let's not get too hung up on that because I was still finishing my thought. It's just really it quick. was effective for that reason, and even though people so we're didn't hung up realize what, <laughs> what, even though people didn't realize what they were hearing, they it was different. So yeah, I already already cut it out. Don't worry. <laughs> I'm, jo- I'm joking. Yeah, yeah. I'm joking. I'm joking. <laughs> anyway, um, but no, the, the, the point. <laughs> the point. The point is. The, the point is that even though I'm making a sacrifice by not making something that I think is actually going to be challenging people or necessarily challenging trends, I'm not sacrificing it by making something that if I would listen to it, I would feel bad about it. Right. You know, it, it like it, that that is really fucking important is how do you actually yeah. feel about what you did? Do you feel proud? I mean, I probably feel pretty proud even though I was somewhat trend chasing and I'm not doing it in order to um, fucking on, be completely honest that project I'm not doing to make other people's lives better I'm doing it to make my fucking life better well, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm already doing a lot of work to make other people's lives better <laughs> Yeah, that's fine. But when you make your own life better, if you're the type of person that facilitates the betterment of others' lives as a result of yours becoming better, then you are making other people's you're, lives you're better. You're preaching the choir on that. That's like, a very like, Ayn Randian like uh, argument. Like Clayton fucking uh, yeah. have his perspective on it. Okay, so I agree. I, I'm with you. That sometimes it's okay to make these decisions, to make a decision based upon a capitalistic response out of it. That's not wrong. Do you mean like, just profit? Yeah. Just profiting? Absolutely. Okay, so for it's example, a weird, I'm just, it's a weird <laughs> project uh, that's out in the market for Marvel Avengers, you know, and designing another one. We're working on it. There's something aspirational at the end of it of trying to become a superhero to find do you, do that. You inspirational? You know, I, I think aspirational. We want to, I mean. Uh, oh, something talk, that makes people aspire to great. Aspire great. Yeah. to okay. be, I yep. mean. At the heart of it, you know, I, I grew up on all of these on Spider-Man, Iron Man, and everybody has a superhero aspect in them that is special and unique and can be brought out, you know, under tribulations and stress. And there's something there that I think people is, that is great. Like, I have something special in me. Yeah. 
but it's a great story about bad guys and good guys. I mean, it's like you don't I don't want to downplay it. But at the end of the day, it's a massive franchise that we're excited and we know it's going to do really well. So like, I don't yeah. apologize for that in the slightest bit. Yeah, I don't but think there's should, aspects. But yeah. you always want to try to add. Is there aspects of aspiration that we can push people yes. to be better? Yes. So it sounds like, you know, you are doing that subtly. Yeah. Or not so subtly. Yeah. Y- yes. Okay. That's that's the thing. And and like I'm not I'm not gonna make a song like Sam Smith made talking about cheating on his fucking girlfriend or wife. Oh, is that a dude. That, it was a dude. Okay. Regardless. Point. <laughs> yeah. Point, well, yeah. Go ahead. Sorry. Point. Please. Point is I'm not going to be talking about any any of that like I'm breaking my integrity or I'm just going to indulge strictly in sexuality for the sake of indulging in sexuality you know like I I think that I can make or we can make that accessible trendy stuff while also keeping two things that we're all three of us like actually proud to put into the world but sometimes you have to tell dark stories to you know, sometimes the dark is the we best wrote a way to song show the light, about a, you know? We wrote a song about a serial killer. Yeah. The, the difference is... Who's Sam, oh, Sam, you mean betrayal? Yeah. Yeah, like Sam, Sam Smith is glorifying that yeah. stuff, whereas we would not be doing yeah. that if we told that. So, like, betrayal is not glorifying. Serial, serial murder is actually used as an analog or, I guess, a metaphor for how people treat each other online, just with absolute ruthlessness. You know, I mean, no, nobody knows yeah. that. Yeah, you can explain it. <laughs> you can, you can, you can sing as uh, the protagonist can be the villain. Uh, I think it can be useful so long as you're, as long as you're portraying the, the suffering that goes along with the, those types of decisions that you make, and that's a cautionary tale, and that's useful because, mm-hmm. and a lot of people feel like they are the villain. You know, it was a fucked up. <laughs> Fucked up thought I had the other the other week. <laughs> you want to say it publicly? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay. I've written songs about this. Uh, well, not about this exact thing, but um, I don't believe like, you. You know, I'm I'm an atheist and mm-hmm. whatever. And <clears throat> a lot of people joke about like, oh, I'm not gonna go to heaven when I die or whatever. And like. If you really believe there is one, for people that like really believe that there is one, and I don't, but I I considered it. I like put myself in that place because I was writing this song called "The New Forever." Um, that's about it's uh, with Yuka, and it's about the idea that people have. To, a lot of people want to have some kind of way of connecting to immortality they want to feel like they never stop going on you want a reason and yeah, yeah. but it, it has to be they have to escape the, the the finiteness of mortality and so much of life is wrestling with that and so when you stop believing in the afterlife what is it that becomes your new forever um and when i was writing this song the lyrics for this i I had a, I had this realization, like, a lot of people joke that they say they're not going to go to heaven when they die, and they have some set of criterion for why they would or wouldn't. When I order my coffee, but, I always say black is my soul, so... I yeah, but, but, like, I really don't, I, like, really don't think I would, like, seriously... People like all joking aside. You're and saying if of, it actually existed. If it if it actually existed, and I, I think a lot of people really why? do really do feel that way. Why Why do you and, think you wouldn't go to heaven? I mean, that's not uh, that I can't talk about. Okay, fair, okay, fair enough. Okay, but like <laughs> another another time, but not on camera. We could talk about C.S. Lewis and go. go but but, and but, but a lot of a lot of a lot of that it, th- that is something that people they joke about it, but when. In the silence of solitude, Oof. it's really Definitely. true. It's really true. And I find so much... Uh, I feel so good about always playing the villain in my music because I want to convey the suffering. I, I want to I put on full display the grotesquerie, the grotesqueries of 
suffering through being the villain, feeling like you are, or actually just knowing you are something, and uh, humanizing that person. Because a lot of people, I don't think, are, are really afraid enough of what really being that is. What are they afraid of? They're not afraid enough of, of what? realizing that they know they're not going to heaven when they die or something or, or, similar. Or, they're okay. not taking it seriously enough. Be, be, being but then also a real villain. A true villain, if you will. Hmm. Or just someone who's not going to heaven. And I, I find that even... <clears throat> so I, I find that, that in portraying the suffering of that knowledge in my art is sometimes... Maybe it's like the best thing I can do for the world is to make it seem as scary as it really should be to people, you know? It's kind of so, Alice Cooper-ish. Maybe. I yeah, don't know his music point. well enough, but uh, but that's... So even even then, I think it, it's useful, that type of storytelling. And oh, yeah. With what you're talking about, um, the brands that you're talking about, it it's like as as commonplace as the hero's journey might be, B, it's still something that everyone wants to see in themselves. They and if they were late, or not that that's who you said, but just any one of these. Uh, <laughs> no, it's okay. I, I, any, any, okay, so yeah, so just wh- wh- whoever whoever one of these famous uh, characters is that this expansive just mythos. Give me more that, work, thanks. Give me yeah. more work, Casey. <laughs> There's so many I mean, of these types of of mythos seas uh, that 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 uh, the hero kind of journey, never die. I mean, we want to be the hero. I mean, we all want to be the hero of our own story. I mean, everybody is living a movie, and we think that we're the main character. We're the main character, but can we think about other people too? And it's like most of the the hero's journey is inherently selfish. And that's that's part of life. It, life is. Can can I can I slightly that, yeah. amend that? Go ahead. Not selfish, self centered. Well said. Um, Rand would argue they are not. Yeah, yeah. fuck Rand. We don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm but I mean, I like, the, I, I like stories of light and dark. I love anything of of heroes and villains. Mm-hmm. What? You touch touch my breast. Mm-hmm. Right. <laughs> Squeeze. Pretty, pretty pretty nice. <laughs> yeah. Right, Wait. Can continue. <laughs> and we're off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The light and the dark, the synthesis of opposites. Yeah. Yeah. But There's no light without the dark. Like, okay. Fuck like, off. No, not, not you. <laughs> a Christian thing to say. Really? I don't know. I'm not Christian, so. I mean. Y- there, y'all tell me. There, there are left. Are you Catholic or what denomination? Liturgical, non-denominational. Okay. It's like Jay. I believe, and I also, I'm a big believer in not, uh, in non-judgment, non-proselytizing. Okay. I think it's intensely personal, and the minute that you focus on it, anything more than that, you're just a salesman. So what what was your experience with that uh, being, having been in the Christian contemporary music oh, industry? That's not what you were when you were in the industry. No, uh, you weren't Christian. Well, yeah, well, yeah, I was. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And I still oh. am, but it's yeah. like, I don't, it's, to me, it's a personal relationship and, and uh, a choice that we all have to have. And I, I've just been around... <clears throat> A lot of salesmen in my life, and it's hard not to feel like you're okay. Are you gonna try to sell me a car, okay, or are we just gonna have a conversation about it? Conversations are great, huh. but um, specific, like so. I worked on the on a movie, The Chronicles of Narnia. Uh, oh yeah, and I was got to be the marketing director on the movie, and I didn't oh, know cool. what the, what I was doing. Um, but it's a very different to work on some of these uh, major movies where one is. Harry Potter, where it's much more nuanced, and then you have a Narnia where it's hit you over the head with Aslan, you know, and and mm-hmm. the stories that are a little bit more, yeah, there's not much subtlety, but there's there children's stories, and there's there's really kind of a beauty, I would say, in in belief or disbelief. You know, so I, I mm-hmm. think there's. I've always liked C.S. Lewis's approaches. Like he's a full-on atheist. <laughs> what C.S. Lewis? Yeah, no, he wasn't. No, he was. I mean, no, he wasn't. Like, like he, he, he was Christian. He was an atheist, and then <clears throat> talked himself into it. Oh, okay. Well, nobody else talked him into it. But like he was a full-on atheist. Okay. And like he ended up I didn't telling even know some he of these was ever. 
Okay. Yeah. But like his stories are non like they're quite offensive to a lot of Christians because it questions purgatory, hell, does hell exist? Um a lot of stuff you would love just how, because it's how not, dare you have questions. <laughs> how it, dare you some of C.S. Lewis's key questions was it was basically a question of hell even existed. Uh-huh. And it was fascinating. Yeah. But like, I like people who ask questions rather than answers, you know, rather than like provide answers and like bash you over the head over it. So arrogant to provide answers. I know. It's so boring to. Until somebody has who asked. Who are you? The fuck are you that you know? Until somebody know. has asked you a question, you can't really give an answer. Uh, otherwise, and if you just give answers, you're pre, you're being proselytizing. Yeah. Interesting. You said you went to the non, not not. Do you say non-denominational liturgical whatever? Uh, I, it, my, our family will go to a to an Anglican church a couple times a year. Where? Okay, gotcha. Uh, I, 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 hey, fucking, let me finish a goddamn thought. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Fucking, I uh, just this past Sunday went to a Greek Orthodox liturgy. Yeah. Oh, you went with Brandon Nelson? Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah. It was great. I, 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 okay. Besides all the standing, and the four hours of sleep I got that night, I liked it. Yeah, I actually loved. Um, since, since we can relate this back to music for the podcast, the music was fucking awesome. Yeah. It was really good. It was, uh, it was It's was not ancient. showy. It no. was just, it's deep. It's, it's ancient yeah. and primal. It's That's awesome. So, it's so cool. And, you know, I, I went to a church for a while with Flourishes Dave. of different modes for different parts yeah. of the liturgy, man. So it's you, great. You'll oh, love this, great, Casey. Yeah. I used to go to church uh, with Dave Mustaine, who would sit behind me. We'd be singing the hymns, and you're like, it's Dave flipping the stain, <laughs> singing, you know, yeah. Amazing Grace Hound, right behind him. <laughs> yeah. In ages past. <laughs> <laughs> But it's like, it's, but the point isn't what we believe, you know, it's like our, our, each person has to like come to their own conclusions on any of it, but like, can we move people to think beyond or challenge people rather than like going on to the fact of like, we, we, uh, to, to, we were saying earlier, people think that their stuff is fantastic and without blind spots and they think they're going to be famous and I have a number one song and it's really not very good. So like kind of coming full circle on it, can we employ like honesty, you know, in, in art, can we employ a bit of understanding is like, can we be objective? Can we be objective? Is this a story worth telling? Is this going to add anything to the world? Is, is Am I any good at this? Mm-hmm. And rather than just kind of telling ourselves that we're fantastic, but really inside we're insecure and we want to be famous. We want somebody to tell us that they, that we're great and that we're worthy of attention. Yeah. And so I, I think most people are trying to get, are in creative uh, creative roles to be able to say at a party that they do this or that or that they want a affirmation but that's not the heart of creativity <coughs> creativity should be about pushing people to new ways of thought and just like beyond who they are you know yeah I mean, if you one want to of talk my, about uh, like fucking well, star star wars creativity was all about Adversity and, and overcoming obstacles constantly, mm-hmm. and, and barely <clears throat> saved in anything. Sorry. <laughs> no, yeah. Um, my my friend uh, Anthony, who we were planning on having on at some point uh, soon, and every time I quote him, he he hears it back. He's like, "You fucked it up. Now I have to come on and correct your misrepresentation of me. whatever." But one time he said something that I'll never forget, and he said that. Uh, if the bad guy doesn't seem reasonable, it's propaganda. Mm-hmm. It's not art. Yeah. Uh, okay. Actually, that's an if interesting question. If the bad question. guy doesn't seem reasonable, like in every in, like, in, 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 in a kid in a, is a kid it, show propaganda. I mean, that's that's a good question. That's a really good question. I, I don't mean that cynically. I, I'm like, I mean. Well, I, I think he would. He would. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll badly represent his argument here. Uh, <laughs> it, it's 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 all about. The, the viewer, not the intention. Yeah. So it's. I mean, Die Hard, uh, I forget the bad guy in Die, you know, the first Die Hard, 
was yeah. the most believable bad guy ever. Awesome. But I know a lot of real bad guys who are, you know, bad guys and CEOs. And do they think they're bad guys? No, they think they're the hero. I mean, they think they're the hero of the hero's journey, you know? So it's, it's all about perspective and panorama. And, right? it, yeah. and it's also about moral psychology and, and more, how they relatively perceive morality or if they perceive morality at all. Does you know? the end justify the means? Yeah, well, yeah or, sure. I mean, or even, Thanos. or even, um, <laughs> do, do the ends do the ends matter at all? You know, even yeah, who that cares? Far. Ecclesiastes, right? Or just straight sociology. Everyone's going to die, and the sun's going to supernova, and then What's nothing the point? we ever did will ever matter. <laughs> oh yeah, drinking? but where's, where's Yuko? What I need him to be like? The sun doesn't have the mass to supernova. It's not going to supernova. It's like, mm. oh great, well, that's going to become a what is it? A red dwarf, and then turn into a black hole. Either way, <laughs> eat, drink, and be merry. For tomorrow we shall die. Yeah, well, I don't think that's scientifically. Eat, astro- drink, and be merry. For tomorrow you're going to be on the awful music podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is that my, that's, that's, what the, we that's the name? It, that's yeah. the name. This one? Yes. Oh. The Awful Music Podcast. Yay! More clickbait. Whatever we got to do. Oh, I mean that'd be good for a clip. Metallica Dream Theater. <laughs> no, dream, <laughs> want, no dream theater. No dream theater. I mean, if we're, I mean, no, like, no. Meta- oh. Metallica is the easiest clickbait in the world for my channel. I'm just saying, if, if you want to. Uh, is there? A, I mean, music is one thing. It. Like, is I can't it, do it. Is it? <laughs> no more Metallica. It's good. It's good. It's good. It's I'm good. never talking about Metallica ever again. We're probably we're probably gonna continue yeah. to talk about Metallica. I'm not doing it. It was one of my favorite bands for a decade of my. It was my favorite band for a decade I, of my I, life. By the way, I just read today that the heaviest riff voted of all time was "Sad but True." Fucking riff destroys. Yeah, but it's also God, because God, of the production yeah. and mixing. Bob Rock, A- absolutely. Terry Date, uh, oh, Bob uh, Rock mi- mixed. But Bob, uh, yeah, Bob Rock yeah. produced. He 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 made yeah, the fucking yeah, choices. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, he yeah he didn't. Obviously, again to your point, if if there wasn't a producer to be like, no, two guitars playing the riff is enough here. There might have been more shit, and it would have been less heavy. Actually, they did have that song was they, awesome. They and, did have four guitars, so they quad tracked. Yeah. They they quad tracked it. It Sounds was awesome. it was just that tight. They they like J- James great. was fucking getting his tits rocked trying to nail that perfectly because it's not like you could digitally time correct. That was all tape. Yeah, all fucking tape, dude. Yeah, he nailed the piss out of it. Then you had back in the day, Ford. You know the yeah the Fairlights and the Sinclaviers and you know like my favorite producer of all time. Uh, you know this minor artist ACDC, Def Leppard, Shania yeah. Twain, Mutt Lang. Yeah, duh. I mean, like, yeah. it, but like you know you track ten tracks of just the G string and then the B and then just because you have uh, three hundred tracks of a chord, you know, just yeah. to make it sound that way. Yeah, and then it just ends up sounding like one chord though. Wall of sound. Oh, but, but a great yeah, yeah, I heard a story about him where he uh oh, I think it was for Def Leppard, he didn't like the way that the chord sounded fretted, so he had a tech come in string uh like seven guitars for every chord but open. Yeah, yeah, pretty Cause, wild. Because you didn't like the way that it didn't have the right sustain when it was fretted, or so or like every or like, every chord open tuning. Well, he, so even more than that, mm-hmm. like sounds awesome though. He he thought like if you strung a chord, it would it wasn't instantaneous because by the time you fret yeah. the first string and the last, yeah. oh, there's a millisecond. So he would go and yeah. record every record every one. But a buddy of mine was playing guitar for, for, for Shania the record, Twain is unnecessary, yeah. but really cool. <laughs> yes. Why not? <laughs> it sounds different than strumming yeah. a chord. It, it is sounds actually, different. That's is, for sure. I don't know if it's better or whatever. But Sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Continue. So a buddy of mine played guitar for Shania Twain on her first, on that massive arena stadium tour. The, I think it was 97, maybe. So, like, they he spent, like, six months recording and rehearsing, sorry, rehearsing at Malang's house with Shania Twain. Three months just with Mutt Lang. 
Oh, and wow. then you had three months with Shania and every single day, like for a week, seven days in a row, it would be one song and it would be from 8 a.m. till 7 p.m. at night. The same song over and over and over and over again. But like he just said, like Mutt Lang would hear the tiniest of the little things. But he said after a while, you know, it's second nature. So you're not even thinking of the song anymore. You're thinking of like what you're going to eat later on in the afternoon and what I'm, you know, anything else. What, what was the point oh. of doing that so it's second it's nature it's tight. muscle memory it's like m- that music and muscle memory can be very similar for for the record <clears throat> no for the performance oh yeah. so okay, okay. so when you okay. get to performance one you've been rehearsing for six months and you're not even worrying about it you're thinking about you're not even thinking about it but i, I guess yeah. it, it was surprising to me that mutt lang was involved with producing a live his, performance i didn't know he did that well, it was his wife uh, uh, okay, time. well, I'm, there's I'm, a guy, I'm, I'm an idiot, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah. There's a guy, there's a, there's a, a guy, a huge producer uh, right now named Joey Moy. He did Nickelback. He did uh, Florida Georgia Line. Uh, uh, and he, he, I have a friend who plays guitar or played guitar for an artist that he's a year ago was producing. And he was, he was that involved in the, in the live show too, making sure that it, he was there for rehearsals, trolling each player, how to, you know. Um, he, he, he is I a love pro- that. He's actually. a producer for them for, like, the band, not just a record, I guess. Like, in that in that. I, I guess that makes him that, but... Yeah. Um, I, I guess I, I would ask, because, like, fucking Bob Rock was, like, Metallica's producer for, like, a good long while, and he was involved in the, in the live process and shit like that. Hmm. But, like, I feel like that's very well, a lot atypical of, a, a for lot, a lot of bands. I mean, a lot of times, if, you know, producers are developing an artist... They they have yeah. to know how to present the artist in in their like holistically, so they have to worry about the way that the the music is carried forth into the world and popularized and yeah, you know. So they have to care about the 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 tour, the way it sounds, and uh, kind of going three sixty to the very top of a conversation. It's like that's kind of how you have to do everything. Like it come like I, I had this phrase that I think of all the time with any project that I'm running, and it goes back to what makes an electric guitar sound like the right, you know, perfect. And it's from the moment of the strings. Is it the pickups? Is it the, is it the tone pot? Is it the chord? Is it the amp? Is it this? And it's like, everything affects everything. It's it's the cab and the mic. That's the secret. (laughs) No, no, it's not. Everything affects everything. Everything does affect everything, but some, some lift more weight than others. I'll just say that. Mm. No, I mean, I think that it, you have to be, it's about the devil and the details on the smallest thing. That That's true. That and is like, very true. It's the tone pot. Is it, uh, you know, what kind of tone pot? But like, in the, if, if you have a fucking shitty guitar cable, that can ruin yeah. your tone totally but, with you there. And to my point, we're going 360 is any one thing out of sync can screw up an entire project. Yeah. And like, if from merchandising, you know, if we're looking at something holistically, a producer should like what we've just been BSing about and which is kind of proving my point is like you have to have somebody that can shepherd a project and they can think holistically about what are we selling? What is this? How does this work? How is this packaged? Ultimately, I'm going to make money out of it, you know, from a good producer of a Bob Rock. You know, if Metallica or somebody, you know, sells five billion records, they're going to make really a lot of money. But a lot of that goes into how does that how is the tiniest little things? And so you have to shepherd it. You have to protect it. And I argue that it's actually more about keeping all the BS away than it is about finding the right stuff to include. Yes, I got. Yeah. Less is yeah. more, less is more, less is more, less is more. What is the heart? What are we trying to protect? What is unique? What makes this special? What makes this be compelling? The connects that is as, you know, aspirational or villainish, whatever the story is, what makes it so special that everything get out of the fucking way? Mm-hmm. I feel like yeah. that is the perfect way of ending. Good. That was be- a beautiful summation. Yeah. Damn. Bam, yeah, because it's Good. almost done. Good. Or the serendipity. Perfect. Uh, Clayton, you want to shout anything out or just want to tell the people to, like, even if it's not your stuff, just, like, want to tell people to go check something out? Uh, there's this really great band, a brand new band called Crusade. <laughs> 
Yeah. And you should see our show on April 23rd in Nashville. Yeah, you know what? <laughs> Go to Spotify, mofos. You know, it's, yeah, you, uh, they're, they're kind of they're kind of good. This guy is a great producer, incredible Thanks. songwriter. He, he produced our latest single, Betrayal, and mixed. A- and mixed. Sorry, <laughs> yeah. my apologies. Yes, yes. Sorry, I did leave that out. I mean, at the end and of the day, like we got to be music. Ner- we're music nerds. Like we, oh, we yeah. have to be nerds and be passionate about something. So it's like it doesn't matter. So like, yeah, you got a great band. You're Thanks, awesome. Man. And, and okay, you likewise. are one of my favorite people that I've ever met in my life. God bless America. All right. Peace. <laughs>